During this segment of our course, we will cover the major practices and procedures with which you should be familiar in the removal and installation of split-sleeve bearings with and without shoulders. For our demonstration purposes during this segment, we will utilize this small parallel shaft gearbox, which is equipped with split-sleeve bearings. The first step, of course, is to assemble the required tools for the job. And don't forget your personal protective equipment. After your preparations are complete, it will be necessary to disassemble the equipment to the point which will expose the bearings. In this gearbox, we must remove the cover, as shown here. The cover itself takes the place of the bearing caps. With the bearings exposed, the workman may now remove the bolts which secure the top halves to the bottom halves. The top halves should then be lifted off, as shown here. Be very careful when handling these bearings, since you want to avoid any type of damage to the lining. After the top halves have been removed, the rotating assemblies should be lifted out of the case like this. In some pieces of equipment, there is only one assembly. However, this gearbox has a high-speed assembly and a low-speed assembly, both of which must be removed. With the assemblies out of the way, the workman may simply lift the bottom halves of the sleeve bearings out of their fits in the lower half of the case. This particular gearbox is equipped with a plain sleeve bearing and a sleeve bearing with a thrust shoulder, as being pointed out here. Therefore, the bearings in this gearbox will afford us the opportunity to explain both basic types of split sleeve bearings. As with any piece of equipment, it is necessary that all parts be thoroughly cleaned after disassembly is completed. Follow the cleaning practices which have been set up at your plant. If you have any questions on this, ask your instructor. After all parts have been carefully cleaned, they should be inspected for damage or unusual wear. This should include all parts as well as the bearings. The condition of the bearing fits on the rotating assembly is also extremely important to the efficient operation of the bearings. Each of the assemblies should be mounted between centers in a lathe, like this. Then the shaft should be carefully polished, just enough to remove residue and expose any wear or damage. Do not remove enough metal to change the clearances. After polishing and inspecting the shaft, Mount a dial indicator on the lathe and use it to check the rotating assembly for straight. The final step is to mic each of the bearing fits to see if they are worn bad enough to require repair or replacement. Complete any repairs which are required and obtain replacement parts as necessary. You are now ready to reinstall the bearings in the gearbox. The first step in the reinstallation of the bearings is to check the contact pattern of the bearings with the shaft journals. To do this, the workman applies a light coat of Prussian blue to each of the shaft bearing journals. He then locates the correct bearing for the journal and rotates it on the shaft journal like this, holding it firmly in contact. He repeats the procedure for each of the bearing halves, top and bottom. Inspect the contact pattern shown by the Prussian blue, like this. Then double-check the contact pattern against the specifications set forth in the manufacturer's manual. The manual may show examples of acceptable contact patterns, or it may simply specify the percentage of contact which is required for efficient operation of the bearing. If there are any high spots in any of the bearings, they will normally show up similar to the spot being pointed out here by the workman. This may often be remedied by scraping the high spot like this, then repeating the contact check with Prussian blue to ensure that the contact is within acceptable limits. After you have completed your checks of the shaft bearing contact, clean all of the Prussian blue from the shaft bearing journals and from the sleeve bearings. The next step will be to install the lower halves of all of the bearings in their matching fits 
in the lower half of the case. Be very sure that the fits and bearings are clean to ensure secure fits. Now lower both of the rotating assemblies into place. Be very careful not to damage the bearings while doing so. Our next step will be to check the thrust clearance between the thrust face on this sleeve bearing and the surface of the gear which rides against the face. To complete this check, the workman mounts a dial indicator on the bottom half of the case with the foot positioned against the end of the shaft, like this. He then moves the rotating assembly as far as it will go in one direction. In this case, he is pushing the shaft away from him as far as it will go. When the shaft is at the end of its travel, he zeroes the dial indicator, then moves the rotating assembly as far as it will go in the opposite direction. The reading now shown on the indicator is the total thrust clearance. It should be checked against the manufacturer's specifications to ensure that it is within acceptable limits. If adjustments are required to the clearance, refer to the manufacturer's manual for instructions, since the procedure could vary from one piece of equipment to another. Upon completion of the thrust clearance check, the workman removes the dial indicator and puts it away. Our next check will be of the bearing clearance, bearing alignment, and bearing pinch. However, a light coat of oil should be applied to all of the shaft-bearing journals prior to beginning the checks. The oil will help to prevent the plastic gauge from sticking to the shaft during the check of bearing clearance. Select the proper diameter plastic gauge to be used in measuring the bearing clearances. This material is manufactured in different sizes to measure different clearances. Therefore, it is important that you obtain the proper plastic gauge for the expected amount of clearance to be measured. One strip of plastic gauge should be positioned in the center of the journal, like this. As you can see, it is placed around the exposed circumference of the shaft. Two additional strips of plastic gauge should then be placed on the shaft bearing journal just inside the outer edges of the bearing, as shown here. Each of the three strips should be long enough to cover about 90% of the exposed bearing journal. This procedure should be repeated for each of the other bearing journals in the gearbox. Three strips for each bearing journal. Once the plastic gauge is in place, apply a light coat of oil to the bearing surface in each of the bearing top halves. This will prevent the plastic gauge from sticking to them during the measurement. Now lower the top halves of the bearings carefully into place on the shaft. Do not rotate the bearings or the shaft, and do not move the bearing back and forth axially when placing them in position. This would destroy the accuracy of your measurement. Bolt the bearings in place. Since we will be checking the bearing pinch at the same time as we check the clearance, the next step will be to obtain a number of shims like these. The desired thickness of the shims is four to six thousandths of an inch. However, it is very important that all of the shims are of the same thickness. Position the shims along both sides of each shaft bearing, as shown here. The purpose of the shims is to prevent the bearing cap, in this case the top half of the case, from coming into full contact with the tops of the bearings. We will show you what we mean in a few moments. To measure the bearing pinch, we will use lead wire, commonly called fuse wire. It should be no more than 15 thousandths of an inch in diameter. Place two pieces of fuse wire on top of each bearing, just inside the end of each bearing, like this. As you can see, it is in approximately the same position as the two outer strips of plastic gauge underneath the bearing. Repeat this procedure with all of the bearings. 
Now, lower the top half of the case very carefully onto the bottom half, taking care not to disturb the position of the fuse wire. Again, this is very important for accurate measurement. With the cover in place, tighten the bolts down all the way as though the gearbox were going back into operation. Now let's use a graphic illustration to show what we're doing. This is a cutaway side view of one of the bearings inside the gearbox. As you can see, the illustration shows the shaft, the bearing, and the case, which serves as a bearing housing or cap. This illustration shows the three strips of plastic gauge we placed between the shaft journal and the bearing. When we replaced the top half of the bearing and tightened it down, it flattened the plastic gauge. We'll be able to measure the width of the plastic gauge later and determine what the actual clearance between the shaft and bearing is. These are the two strips of fuse wire between the top of the bearing and the bearing fit in the case. They also have been flattened somewhat by the case as it was tightened down. The fuse wire is used to measure the amount of pinch between the case and the bearing. In an ideal situation, there would be no space at all between the case and the bearing. However, we placed shims alongside each of the bearings before we installed the case cover. Therefore, the shims are holding the cover up off the bearings. If the bearing pinch is perfect, the thickness of the fuse wire will be identical to the thickness of the shims. Now, let's take the gearbox apart again, and you can see the results for yourself. Remove the bolts from the case cover. Then lift the case cover straight up off the bearings with a hoist, like this. Remember that you must be very careful not to disturb the position of the fuse wire when doing so, as this could destroy the accuracy of your measurements. Now measure the thickness of the fuse wire at the point which was directly on top of the bearing. As we mentioned a few moments ago, the thickness of the fuse wire should be identical to the thickness of the shims, or very close to it. If the thickness of the fuse wire is more than the thickness of the shims, this would indicate insufficient bearing pinch, and corrective steps should be taken. If adjustments are necessary, they would be made to the cap or cover. Refer to the manufacturer's manual for specific instructions. You would then repeat the procedure to check the pinch on all of the other bearings using the same comparison. Remove all of the shims as you do so. After completing your check of the bearing pinch, remove the bolts securing the top halves of the sleeve bearings to the bottom halves. Lift the top halves of the sleeve bearings straight up off the shaft, being very careful not to move the plastic gauge while doing so. The oil you applied to the bearing earlier should prevent it from sticking. However, extra care in removing the bearing could save your measurement. Now measure the width of the plastic gauge directly on top of the shaft bearing journal, utilizing the scale on the plastic gauge package. The scale converts the width to the actual clearance between the shaft journal and bearing. Compare the clearance indicated by the plastic gauge to the specifications set forth in the manufacturer's manual. If adjustments are necessary, refer to the manual for instructions on action to be taken. Next, we'll check the bearing alignment. And this is done by measuring the width of the plastic gauge on the side of the journal, like this, at both ends of the journal. And then taking measurements on the opposite side of the journal at both ends. These measurements should be equal. Now, if they are not, the bearing is misaligned, and it will be necessary for you to locate the cause and correct it. Repeat the procedure on all of the bearings. After completing your checks of bearing clearance and alignment, 
Remove all of the plaster gauge from the journals. Now apply more lubricant to all of the shaft bearing journals. Then replace the top halves of the bearings and tighten them down securely. With the bearings in place, rotate the shaft manually to check for any binding. This will also serve to distribute the lubricant over the bearings and shaft journals. Lower the cover back onto the case and secure it with the bolts. Repeat your check for binding by turning the shaft manually again. If any is detected, it will be necessary to locate the problem and correct it. Now check the thrust clearance again to make sure it has not changed from the measurement taken earlier. If it has changed, the cover will have to be removed and the cause of the change determined. From this point on, you would simply complete the reassembly of the piece of equipment as required. These have been the basic procedures for the removal and installation of split-sleeve bearings with and without shoulders. As you may have noticed, the only real difference between the two was that it was necessary to check the thrust clearance on the sleeve bearing which has a thrust shoulder. Other than that, the installation of the two types was identical. If you encounter other variations with which you are unfamiliar, refer to the manufacturer's manual or your supervisor. We'll be back to show you the removal and installation of solid sleeve bearings after you complete exercise number three in your workbook.